Okay, thank you. So I'm going to talk today about elliptic curves. <coughs> so there is a universal elliptic curve, uh, and I would be interested in uh, two things. So you can imagine as a vague cartoon of this curve. So it has some cusp and has CM points. And so this is my modular curve, so to speak. And so uh, I would be interested in modular curve. So first of all, what I'm going to do, I'm going to study uh, pi 1 m of elliptic curve. Let me just write test elliptic curve minus uh, n torsion points with some tangential base point. And then this E will be either universal elliptic curve uh, or uh, I'll take specialization of this to the cusp or I will restrict to CM points. So they will kind of, I would say, two major flavors. So the universal elliptic curve or CM points and universal degenerates to cusps. And so uh, I'm going to study only very simple, the simplest uh, piece, so to speak, of this material synthesis, but not real material fundamental group. And we are going to see that when uh, we live on the universal curve, then we're going to see Bellinson's elements, uh, Bellinson cut Euler system, and actually some kind of complex which resolve it. Which describes the action, which describes some piece of the material fundamental group. So when we degenerate to cusp, we are going to see the picture from the previous lecture, uh, of cyclotomic Lie algebra. And when we, uh, when we specialize to CM points, we are going to see hyperbolic geometry. And this is probably the main focus of this lecture. So I want to do one example, but I wanted to do with highest possible precision. Okay, now let me start. So let me just recall uh, from previous. Uh, discussions that if you have compact, I mean, a regular projective, I change a little bit notations. So today it's regular projective uh, curve over field F. And if you have some set S which sits in F points, and this set uh, has some base point, again, I change slightly notations. And I also have ten some tangent vector in the punctured. Uh, tangent space, then uh, there is the corresponding uh, motivic fundamental group, and it's described as follows. So the most important for us is that we have this uh, Lie algebra uh, related to this pair, which is just cyclic tensor product of associate graded for the weight filtration of the first homology group of X minus S. Modulo sum relations, which I somehow suppress. Uh, and uh, very essentially, tensor is a fundamental class of homology of this curve. So it's a cyclic tensor product of cohomology shifted down by uh, homological fundamental class. So this is a Lie co-algebra. In the category of pure motifs over F. Or in realizations, if you wanted. Now, uh, <coughs> what is good about this is that uh, it just reminds that we have a correlator map related to the story. So we have correlator map which relates to tangential base uh, vector, which is a map from this guy uh, to motivic uh, Lie algebra. So this is remind motivic. The co-algebra. So this is a conjectural object. I mean, we today deal with elliptic curves. So in the elliptic curve case, this is a conjectural object. So if you want to get the theorems, then I either have to do, uh, I, I have to explain why, why I can do things. So, or you can go to realizations. And this is a Lie co-algebra map. And where does it come from? It comes by dualization of the object we really want to look at. So as I said, we have the motivic fundamental group of x minus s. And uh, this is a huge mixed motif. And as such, uh, it can be viewed uh, as a model over the uh, motivic Lie algebra. So there is a canonical map from motivic Lie algebra to uh, the following. So first of all, you take the fiber functor assigned to this model. So now it leaves uh, uh, in the category of pure motor. So you take GERD W. Then <coughs> this is still a Lie algebra. And so our 
more typically algebra x by its optomorphisms, in this case infinitesimal ones, so derivations, and they have some additional property, they're special as we discussed before. And the key point is that this is turns out to be the same as this Cli XS Lee, uh, dual. So, so in the end of the day, you get a map from here. Let's have a name for this map. Now, if you dualize this map, then you get uh, the object we, which we use a tool to use, uh, which we use to study the, the metric fundamental group. So once again, so this is the object which contains all the information about uh, Lee action or Mativi Gallo action on the Mativi fundamental group. And we are going to concentrate. So first of all, I'm going to uh, explain that uh, in the elliptic curve case, so back to elliptic curves, there's, uh, I just want to remind that in the case of GM, there was a nice thing that there was a canonical tangential base point at infinity. We treat GM, but the point is at infinity. And in this case, it seems to be there is none, which is actually not true. There is uh, almost canonical, almost up to six or 12 roots of unity, canonical uh, vector field, or just vector, uh, called V delta on E. And uh, it comes as follows. So if you take the corresponding dual uh, differential one form, so it's dual, so one, then this form is basically, uh, you get it from delta. So this is by definition. So if you raise this one form to 10 to the power 12, then you can write what it is. Just q times 1 minus q to n, where n bigger than 1, raised to power 24. And this we think about as uh, uh, relative forms on the universal curve, elliptic curve over m. Uh, raised to power 12. And so up to this uh, unfortunate uh, 12, it's a root, the 12 roots of unity, it's this completely canonical object, and this is the one we are going to use. So this is our basically canonical tangential point. So <coughs> now, uh, again, if you look now what the story tells you, oh, then the image of the Galois group, let's still have a name for this, let's call this phi X, S. Mm. So uh, let me just have a name. Let me call this as elliptic Lie algebra, which is uh, related to a given elliptic curve E and your choice of a torsion point, N torsion points. So this is, by definition, it's just a notation. Uh, this is the Lie coalgebra, which obtained as follows. So you take the action of the motivic uh, Lie algebra. So you take the image uh, related to the section and you dualize it. So this is a, a Lie algebra. So once again, so if you have elliptic curve minus n torsion points, then you're getting this motivically algebra in the category generated by each one of this elliptic curve. And we are going to think about this. The first uh, thing is that this guy, it's a huge. Uh, pure motif. So it comes with decomposition into isotypical components. Uh, secondly, mm, uh, we want to see uh, who they are. So it wasn't a good idea to spend. Wait a second. So <coughs> let me get to main blackboard. So I wanted to uh, study the simplest non-trivial uh, part of this Lie algebra, but I need to list you the things which are trivial first. So you see that this is really the next one. And so the question is, what are simplest m isotypical components of this L? So. <laughs> On the zero level, you see the following. So you see the thing which is zero, but still uh, worth to be mentioned. So all this, uh, we, we think about uh, all this uh, as typical components as correlators. So we put here delta function and constant sheaf. And then let's think about the weights. So there is a map here, home, 
which is as a motif is q of minus 1. And there is another home here, which is just q. And we have to take this tensor the fundamental class, in our case. So they cancel out. And so in the end, we get something of weight 0. Therefore, it's 0. So this doesn't have any contribution to our story. Again, I'm writing these correlators as a homes between collections of sheaves. So that's zero example. The next example is more interesting. So you can take a correlator where you can put one delta function and two Qs. Then uh, it's going to be of weight uh, plus one. And so how you see it is that you have, uh, of course, the same picture have three maps. So this is as before q of minus 1. And this is h1 of e. And so after you take this tensor h2 of e, you're going to get the weight given by this guy. OK, so that's already quite interesting. And so this belongs to the part of this elliptic guy, which is uh, as a typical component is labeled by first dimensional uh, cohomology. And this is just. <coughs> Uh, torsion, the set of torsion points of your curve of a certain extension. So the answer is this. That's what this vector space looks like. And uh, this Kn is just obtained by taking your base. I said it's F. Let me change it to K. So K is a base field. Uh, K is a joint coordinates and torsion points. All right, so it's a finite dimensional vector space. And how you get from here to here, you assign to this the class in the Jacobian of your. I forgot to mention, actually, that uh, we know uh, A is arbitrary point so far. We don't, make, we don't say it's torsion point. So, so far, it's arbitrary point so that we deal with torsion points. OK, so still, still, it's very useful, but still trivial. The next one is a little less trivial. So the next, so if you think what kind of motif comes after uh, first uh, cohomology, you can say, OK, maybe there are other motifs which are of weight 1. So for example, what about something like you take symmetric cube of h1 of e and you twist it by 1. And it never comes. Uh, I believe it ne never comes in this picture. And we are not going to look at this in any case. So. <coughs> Not there. So the next, therefore, is q of 1. So how we see q of 1, so we draw the correlator like that. So we put two delta functions, and we put two constant sheaves. And now you can count as before that this and this gives you q of, um, q of 1s, q of minus 1s, I mean. And therefore, the total weight is uh, q of 1, q of minus 1. So this belongs to this elliptic guy labeled by q of minus 1. Now the question is what it is. So the claim is that uh, mm, uh, that you get this extension, 0 base field tensor q. Then uh, the guy we are looking for, q of minus 1. And then symmetric uh, square uh, of uh, k star. So this is the structure of the guy where we land. Now, why do we land in this guy and not in the other guy? So uh, what you want to do, you want to study the coproduct. So you want to come up, remember this always here, h2 of e. You want to study what the coproduct of this guy is. And uh, the coproduct is calculated as follows. So let me draw again the same picture. So when you calculate the coproduct, you have to cut. Now, how do you uh, cut? The only way you cannot cut like that, because you see, it will get 0. So the only way you can cut, you, and you cannot cut this way is by 0. So the only way you can cut, you can cut this way. So you cut your picture in 2. And then by the previous example, you see that this is nothing else but, uh, oh, wait a second. I think I'm making. Uh, I'm making a stupid mistake. How did I do this? 
this is, uh, I mean, this elliptic curve itself, I write Jacobian. Uh, this is, of course, not, not K star. This is symmetric square of the elliptic curve. It's of K points on the elliptic curve, not of K star. So uh, how do you see that? So when you make the coproduct, uh, you get wedge product of this guy and this guy. Not symmetric wedge, but this is wedge. Remember that they are kind of framed by the corresponding pure motives. So you have something like Q, Q delta A box times H one of E. And then you wedged with a similar guy, again, this H one of E. And because uh, you live in a super tensor category, so the wedge turns out to be symmetric square. And from here, you get uh, Jacobian. So this proves that you have at least canonical map by the coproduct from this guy here. And then the kernel is X1. It's very easy to see. And so that's it. So, so that's how you get such extension. Okay. Now, <coughs> are there any questions? Yeah. No, 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 no. So H1 is a label. So this, this uh, remember that motivically algebra is a vector space multiplied by pure motor, which gives you the isotypical label. So the label here is this one. The vector space is a Q point of, of the KN points of your elliptic curve. OK? And so same similar things happen here. Now, why do we know uh, such extension? So, I, uh, so now I can explain what actually it is in a different way. So <coughs> this is algebraic version of the theory of modular elliptic units. So let me give you uh, some background on it's called Ziegler units. So I claim that this extension is algebraic version of Ziegler units. So you will see how in a second. So the claim is this, that uh, if you have elliptic curve E uh, over some base B, and if you have some torsion point, Then uh, this creates for you some element that's called theta E of Z, uh, which belongs to the uh, invertible functions on this base, tensor Z 1 over n, is n inverted. So uh, now you can see this. This is the main claim about uh, units, modular units, elliptic units, Ziegler units. You, you can use name depending where, where you sit. But it has two descriptions. So you can describe this analytically. And then you just say the following, that you take your base B to be the curve Y1N, then introduce the standard notations exponent 2 pi i tau, and uh, xi is exponent of 2 pi i psi. Now xi is uh, going to be a torsion point. So this means that this alpha 1, alpha 2 belongs to 1 over n z minus z squared. So it's a torsion point. And then comes the formula. Uh, so the formula is this. This theta e, this is Ziegler unit of z, is defined up to little normalization, so q to second Bernoulli polynomial of alpha 1 times some root of unity. 2 pi i alpha 2 times alpha 1 minus 1 divided by 2. And now the important thing is 1 minus z. You can write it this way. It's a product over n bigger or equal. Uh, let me write it this way. 1 minus q to n z times 1 minus q to n z inverse. And then still 1 minus z here. OK. So this is a classical formula, uh, but this classical formula tells you only what's going on uh, in the torsion points and somehow normalized suitably. So uh, we want to say what happens at every point, not necessarily torsion point. And so for this, we do the following. <coughs> So this is algebraic definition. So uh, there is always extension. I mean, it's the same extension as here. But maybe I can just say that for any elliptic curve over k, you always have extension like, like that, which comes with the following structure. So you have k 
star extended by something. Let me call it in a different way. Let's call just H uh, of K, some group. And this is symmetric square of the K points of your curve. Everything tensor Q. Uh, actually, OK. And it comes with a canonical map from the K points uh, of elliptic curve minus 0. This is a uh, canonical map. So this is, so to speak, the, the motivic height group. Now, where does it come from? So there is a theory it comes from by extensions. From the theory of by extensions. The theory, uh, it, if you just want to state it in a minute, it says the following, that there is a line bundle, canonical line bundle over E cross E, one Carré bundle. And so if you take a pair of point X and Y, then you have the fiber of this bundle here which is just a K star torsor. And so uh, this already uh, defines you some extension of free abelian group generated by, by the points by, by K star. This is just this, uh, the fibers of the Poincaré bundle. But then uh, the theory of by extensions tells you that this Poincaré bundle behaves very well under addition under one argument or the other argument. And this tells you precisely that you have such extension. Now, if you spend a little bit more time with this story, you will see that there is a canonical map like that. So it's written, for example, in our paper with Andre Levin on LA2. You can find all the necessary details about this map. But there is a map like that. And uh, also, if you take K to be uh, some uh, local field, then there is a canonical map from H of K to real numbers or integers. And this is a canonical height. So somehow, this is a motivic incarnation of the height. And that's exactly what we get here. So the claim is uh, that this is a description, that th this extension L Q of minus 1 is just this uh, uh, height group. Now, since you have this canonical map, you can uh, say what's the image of some point Z under this map. And uh, if you take Z to be a torsion point, then you will see that at least if you multiply it by n, it's length in k star. This is a Ziegel unit. So uh, what I was saying, uh, do I need to write it down? OK, let's write it down. So let's take Z in uh, n torsion points. And let's call this canonical projection P. So uh, if you take this uh, canonical map of Z uh, composed with P and multiply this by N, you are going to get 0. This means that this guy belongs to uh, uh, K star. And this is our theta A of Z. That's a notation. So I introduce now the kind of algebraic variant of this formula. All right? Oh, 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 thank you, Akshay. This is the most important part of the story, which I completely forgot to mention. Yes, of course. What is the composition? It's a map given by A going to A dot A. OK? So and uh, all right. So now in our uh, discussion of who is who in the story, so we now know who is Q of 1 component. And I'm going to jump to the one uh, which I'm going to study. The one which I'm going to study is the Q of 2 component. And so let me, mm, where do I want to do this? So let me do it here. So now this is the object of study. So we want to take now what correlator. So we take uh, we take three uh, delta functions, and by the rules we treat them, we are supposed to put the constant shifts between them, and then we picking up the corresponding as a typical component because these three uh, blue maps, as before, are given by Q of minus 1 is the maps which I kind of put here, just Q, so I don't care about them that much. 
And so I get q of minus 3, tensored with fundamental class, I get q of minus 2. So this belongs to this elliptic q of 2. q of minus 2, because I'm thinking about Lico algebra, so the weights go up. All right, this is the guy. So I want to study this guy, but uh, now, mm, uh, first of all, I want to have some statements about this. So now we assume, uh, and that's very important now, that we have three points, let's say A, B, C, uh, which now belong to the torsion points, and torsion points. Then the key thing when we talk about any correlator is what's coproduct. So we just denote by theta x. x is my base point, and v delta, which I'm not going to uh, mention any longer, is a tangent vector here. But then we have the corresponding correlator, which is element of this L q of minus 2. And so this is the main object of studies. So we want to understand how these elements live. Uh, and the first claim is that if you take the coproduct, so the main thing, if you're talking about motivic Lico algebra, so first of all, uh, you can name elements there. But then the main question you ask, you ask what's the coproduct of these elements? Because that's almost all the information is, is in this question. And now the coproduct is given by the following uh, formula. Let me change them to a, a1, a2, a3. So this is just, uh, you, you'll have cyclic shifts of the following expression. You have theta mm, x a1, a2, which theta x of a2, a3, plus uh, uh, cyclic shifts uh, when you take a1, a2, and 3, and you cyclically shift them. So it will be two more terms. Now, who those guys are? So this is the guys which I forgot to mention. So this is the guy which you get here is officially called theta x of a, b. OK? So we have simple coproduct formula. Again, why it's true. So in order to see why it's true, you have to cut this diagram. And it seems that you can cut it in many different ways. So for example, you can cut it like that. But this cut doesn't give you anything modular torsion, because uh, the thing we, which you cut it out here is a, is a zero modular torsion, because this is element of the Jacobian, which is torsion element. So it doesn't count. OK. Then, then the only other thing you can do you can possibly do to get something non-trivial, you can kind of cut it this way. If you cut it this way, you get the answer. Because what you get, you get this uh, correlator with two q's and two points, which is precisely my theta x of two points. Multiply it, which multiply it with another correlator just like that. So the formula is completely obvious from this picture. You just have three cuts, this, this, and this, and that's, that's the formula. OK? So. <coughs> Uh, now, what I want to do, I want to get rid. So, I mean, it's all good, but a little ugly because I have to keep this uh, base point, and I wanted to get rid of this base point. There is a trick which allows me to do it. So, the main point is that I can introduce, like before. Look at this. So, I had a uh, this correlator here, which relates to two points uh, on elliptic curve, and uh, I can actually get away with this map H, because uh, one can easily prove the following formula. I, let me just mention it here. <coughs> that this guy is just the theta E of A minus B minus uh, theta E of x minus a minus theta e of x minus b. So the correlator which we get in the q of 1 case just expressed very simply in the case of kind of the more canonical, which comes from by extension, this uh, uh, set of functions with values in, the, in, the, in this group h of e. So this, this set, uh, remember, they are no longer numbers. There will be numbers only if a and b are torsion points. Otherwise, in this formula true universally, this is just some guys which live in this h of k. And we always have this identity. Why, why it's good? Because it allows you sort of forget about the torsion points. So you just need to deal about this function, about this, this gadget, which is on the right-hand side of the blackboard. 
which uh, you have illusion is defined without a uh, base point. It, it is defined using the zero base point and this canonical base vector, but you somehow just will after this with this, this, this points in elliptic curve. So I can do the same trick in that situation. Hmm? I call it H at certain moment, but then I change it to, I probably should better call it theta, but theta is overused in this lecture. Why I emphasize this so much? Because uh, I wanted to introduce the object which seems to have uh, no tangential base point. So this is average base point construction. So what, what I do, I just construct the elements called theta e of a1, a2, a3, which is just the average of all this theta x of a1, a2, a3, where x runs through all torsion points on your curve. So this way, first of all, I kind of getting rid of this x, at least in notations. And certainly, uh, the obtained object is invariant under simultaneous shift on the nodes because I took the average. So it seems that I lost information because I have all those guys and then get just to the guys like that. It turns out that I don't, that there is some, uh, it's an important but very technical remark that I'm not losing information, which tells me that I can express, you shouldn't even write this down, just tells you that this guy can be expressed as, in a certain way, as a sum of this theta is. So let me see, do I want to, okay, let, let me write this formula. Uh, so this guy, is just theta e, which I just introduced, of a1, a2, a3, uh, plus cyclic shifts of theta e of a0, a1, a2, x, a cyclic shifts with respect to a1, a2, and 3. Again, it doesn't really matter what this formula tells you, uh, what, what, what this formula exactly is and how it's proved. The only thing which is important is that I really want to stick to this uh, kind of elements in Motivic Lie algebra, and they have exactly the same information as the original ones, but just it's, uh, they're, they're more nicer objects. That's all. Okay, so after that, <coughs> I can state the main uh, result about those uh, guys. So one can call them double elliptic units or double modular units. They're Q of two generalization of the Ziegler units. So maybe I should make this point that this guy is a kind of Q of two version of modular, or you can call them elliptic, or you can call them Ziegler unit. They're no longer units, they're elements of some vector space. But still. OK, so the main theorem about them is the following, that given uh, three torsion points, let's say a1, a2, a3, which belongs to torsion points and torsion points on the elliptic curve, uh, we have the following facts. So first of all, there is a coproduct formula. Remember that we had coproduct formula for those guys with axes, with base points, but now we have coproduct formula for these guys, which is essentially as simple. This is theta e of a0 minus a1, which theta e of a1 minus a2 plus theta e of a1 minus a2, which theta e of a2 minus a0 plus theta e of a0 minus, a2, sorry, minus a0, which theta 0 of a0 minus a1. Hmm? Oh, this is because I'm rushing ahead. 1, 2, 2, 3, oh, 2, 3, 3, 1, 3, 1, 1, 2, okay? So this is a cyclic shift of this 
formula. So uh, mm, then mm, the second main property. Again, this, this is the main point about this uh, weight to uh, analogs of modular units. So this is some guys uh, which live in motivic Lico algebra, but when they co-multiply, they co-multiply to the wedge product of Ziegler units. Uh, I just repeat again, this is the main point about them. And uh, then the second point in this, this double units or whatever you might call them, uh, satisfy uh, some relations, some easy relations. So the relations are, of s mm, first of all, there is what's called shuffle rel rel relations. You will not see anything shuffle just to, to keep with some kind of broader point of view on this. But you, what you will see, you'll see that they just skew, uh, skew symmetric. So theta e of a sigma of 1, a sigma of 2, a sigma of tr 3 is the same thing as minus 1 to sigma uh, of a, sorry, theta e of a 1, a 2, a 3 for any uh, permutation of the symmetric group. Okay? And uh, the second relation, which is also very useful to us, is that for any Automorphism of elliptic curve, this uh, double units are invariant. So they are naturally defined objects invariant by automorphisms. And there are some distribution relations which I'm not going to use. So maybe, OK, I can write them down. But it's not important for today's lecture. If you sum over all AIs, which project to AI under some isogeny, I'll call it psi. So psi is isogeny from E prime to E. Uh, and you sum over all possible things, then you get just the original one. OK, you can immediately forget this one, but we better keep uh, the first two in our memory. So OK, and once again, this, th this is the, the most important thing which we wanted to know about this double elliptic unix, the echo product formula and the asymmetries. <laughs> uh, all right, now from here I can go two different ways. So I can either immediately switch to the torsion point uh, game uh, and uh, investigate this example in all details, or I can go to the universal elliptic curve, because this guy is defined for any curve over any base. I can study them in a family, or I can study them uh, in, in, in one particular example. And uh, <coughs> Still, there are some properties which are common to both of them. So let me just. <coughs> some features of what's going on. So uh, there are two flavors, as I said. Uh, so first of all, <laughs> You can either consider the universal at the curve over, say, y1 of n. And in this case, you get uh, the following guys. So you get, I denote them as kind of bold face E. So you get vector space E2 related to this modular curve. And this is, by definition, the space which is spanned by this double uh, modular units. Uh, where I remind you that AI are torsion points. Uh, and this is span over Q. So this is all in all, it's a finite dimensional vector space. Or you can consider still the guy which you get in the Q of 1. 2 is related to Q of 2. Uh, in the Q of 1 case, 
And so this is spanned by just set of E of A, where A is a torsion. And uh, this is what you do in this kind of flavor. Or you can say that you want to restrict to CM point Mm. And in this case, the situation is falling. Uh, so you have some field, which is imaginary quadratic field. So actually, uh, in today's lectures, I will assume, I don't have to do this now, but I will assume that d equals 1 or 3, because that's where I can draw pictures and get the maximum precision. But in general, you can consider the elliptic curve EK, where uh, the ring of integers of OK x by endomorphisms. And I'm going to pick up some ideal here. Could be any ideal, but I'm going to pick up prime ideal uh, in the end of the day. So let me pick up prime just now. And then I still have these two spaces. So I have the corresponding space E, let me call it just E sub P uh, 2. And I have the corresponding space E sub P1. I don't know whether I need to write down the definition. I think the definition is, is completely clear because you just mimic this definition and just put here a 1, a 2, and 3 being torsion points for that particular uh, elliptic curve. So just write one of them. This is theta E of a 1, a 2, a 3, where a i belongs to E, k, p, q, and, and so on. Just the E of A. OK, so uh, now uh, what role these two vector spaces play? P is the number for the CM huh? P is the number for the CM bonds, uh, considering V2 index lower. Oh, P, yeah, uh, you're right. That I, I really should have a better notation, something like E, K, and P. But I'm not going, since this. Notation is going to be used often. I'm not going to write it all the time. So it is assumed that I'm talking about one particular elliptic curve and uh, any prime ideal related to that. Is that okay? And I am sorry for all this multitude of E's and setters. Now, okay, uh, what 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 does it mean? That in any case. Uh, uh, we get a complex. So this complex is my weight two space with any label you like, co-multiplied to the uh, weight square of the E1 space with any label uh, you consider. So we get a length two complex. Now, giving yourself a length two complex like that, is exactly the same thing as to say that uh, we get a graded uh, Lie algebra. So this graded Lie algebra is just E1 direct sum E2. And so this is the first point. So the point is that I got from my elliptic curves complex uh, because of the theorem which I formulated. The C2 are co-multiplied at wedge squares of the uh, Ziegel units. Or it is the same as telling you that I, I constructed a Lie algebra, Lie co-algebra. Why? Because you can just say that you have a co-product uh, which defines you the co-commutator map. This is a co commutator. OK? So just the same. And so now the point is that this Lie co algebra is exactly uh, the Q of 2 component of the image of the Mativi Galois Lie algebra acting on elliptic curve minus n torsion points. So that, that's the meaning of it. So this, this complex is uh, some sub Lie co algebra in the huge. Uh, uh, Lie algebra, which is the image of the Galois group. And this sub Lie algebra is the one which you see uh, in the isotypical component Q of 2. Okay? So 
uh, this Lieco algebra is the analog of this elliptic units because elliptic units give you just Q of 1, and this Lieco algebra gives you Q of 2. And so it's no longer commutative. <coughs> Yes, if you go to the level of the Lie algebra, then I'm talking about constructing. I just constructed, because of all this formalism, I just constructed one specific quotient of the uh, image of the Galois group acting on the fundamental uh, group of the elliptic curve minus n torsion points. So I, I cleanly constructed a quotient of this image of the Galois, Galois Lie algebra because I constructed some uh, sub coalgebra in the huge uh, Lie coalgebra, which is the dual of that Lie algebra. Okay? So one can say more invariantly, but I mean, in, in different ways, how, how you can construct it. But for me, the best way to say this is just a Q of two component uh, of this big guy. All right. So <coughs> now, um, mm, let me just write down the, the here the, the highlight of what's going on. Hmm? No, no, Q of 2. This is this complex, uh, well, you're right. <laughs> this complex lives in, in, in the degree Q of 2. And so that's why I'm saying Q of 2 all the time. So the Cochain complex has definite degree. But when I'm talking about Lie coalgebra, it has several components. And in this case, the components are in this is uh, Q of 1 and Q of 2. And to be precise, Q of minus 1 plus Q of minus 2 components. And this follows from the discussion before. I just described it before. All you can get in Q of minus 1 components. And we have seen that there is nothing else but, by, by, but elliptic units by, by construction. This is actually the, uh, for me, this is the benefit of talking this motivic correlator language. Because the things which are difficult, a little difficult if you look at this in different point of view, here they come ju just, ju just uh, immediately and uh, as a result of very easy calculation. All right. So. Uh, now, what's the point of this? So in the universal case, this one, uh, so uh, if you just consider this complex, Then if you take the co-kernel of this complex, uh, this is precisely uh, Balenson's classes. In K2 of this Y1 of n. And uh, from this, you can go to other system. It goes to balancing kato other system, if you start varying ends. Uh, on the other hand, uh, from our point of view, uh, again, I, I stress again, so if you take the co-kernel of this map, you land on K2. But for us, the most interesting thing is this. This is a trivial thing. This is just Ziegel units. And this is where the whole uh, s uh, story is developing. And uh, if you just uh, go to K2, then you completely miss this part of the story. You just look at the Euler system and say that's it. But uh, from this point of view, you get a complex, so I call it Euler complex. And it's uh, resolution, so to speak, of this Bellinson's classes. Uh, and uh, the main point is this, that when you specialize Uh, I mean, it's a quotient of this by the image of that. How it's called? Co I think it's called co-kernel, yes. But again, let, <laughs> let me repeat my point that I take here co-kernel, I mean, I live here. But for us, the interesting things happen here, not there. OK. Mm? Yes, 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 yes. So you. So what it is, it's actually a subcomplex is a uh, what's called Bloch complex, which lives on y1 of n. So there is a, so this natural lives in the Bloch complex. I'm probably not going to say right now what this is. Uh, 
And uh, so if you take the co-kernel in the block complex, you always get K2. And so what we get here, we get here a statement that we see some uh, Steinbeck relations between this balance. And some, some linear combination of balance and elements are explicitly Steinbeck relations. That's uh, the, the statement which I proved this way. OK. Now let's go and see what we can say about this. So now there's key construction. I repeat again and again that from this point of view, we are interested in a thing which is a completely missed when you're just looking on, let's say, L functions or balance sense elements, because we are looking on relations between balance sense elements. And these relations form the, the image of the Galois group, the interesting part. All right, now key construction. This construction is a variation of the same kind of construction which I gave last time when I map a modular complex uh, to some motivic complex. So let me recall the modular complex. So it's a complex of two terms. Uh, so it has two terms. And I uh, rename them, uh, comparing to previous lecture, I call it M2, and I call this M1, uh, because this is, it's now a chain complex of triangles and the geodesics. Uh, my apology for putting in this is still upstairs. But what it is, it's just a free abelian group generated by oriented triangles. So you remember that we have the stammered picture So 0, 1, infinity 2, and so on. And uh, so uh, this is a modular complex is a chain complex of this guy where you take triangles and geodesics. And so this is Z of oriented geodesics. And so there is a natural differential here. And so, uh, hmm? so here it's referred to Z or no. No, 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 just a second. It's coming. So that's a point. We have GL2Z. So it acts on the upper half plane because it's just C minus R divided by Z equivalent to Z bar. So this is a GL2Z model. And uh, it acts here and therefore acts on whatever we consider on modular complex. And now the theorem <coughs> Oh, this is very unfortunate. Anyway. I'm going to use this here right now. <laughs> So the theorem is that there exists canonical uh, subjective map uh, of complexes. So here we take the modular complex Maybe I, I, I write in here 2, 2 all the time because modular co complex exists for any n. It exists for, for, 100, for 100, for example. But since I'm using only m2, I'm no longer going to write them. Uh, so it takes this complex tensor or, uh, over group gamma 1. And what I'm going to do, you can do on any modular curve. I decided to do gamma 1 of n. You can have gamma of n or some other flavor. Let's do it this way. So you map it for this elliptic guy related to y1 of n sub 2 uh, co-product of h2 of the Ziegler units. So Sorry, what? The tensor of 
uh, this is tensor. So the group GL to ZX here, in particular this group X there. So I can take covariance. I can do it this way. But I also tensor with Q. So. Uh, so there is a canonical map. It's even shorter this way. And uh, in order to describe this map, uh, so I need to very carefully explain what this co coinvariance looks here and there. And this basically has been done last time. But let me just repeat it. So how you construct this map of complexes. Uh, I'm just saying again that the construction I'm going to give right now will be a deformation of the construction which I had last time from the cyclotomic case to the elliptic case. So the formulas will look identically the same, except whenever I use before cyclotomic unit, I'm going to use elliptic unit. Whenever I use before uh, something else, I'm going to use this double unit. Whenever I use a correlator before, I'm going to use this elliptic correlator. OK, so how the, this complex looks like. So you can take uh, Q of gamma 1 of n, GL to z. Uh, let's say tensor some character over some little group d2. And that's precisely what you see here. So I take covariance, and then uh, the point is that the group GL to Z acts on this set of triangles, but it has a non trivial stabilizer. So the order of the stabilizer is 12, and there is a determinant character from the stabilizer plus minus 1 given by determinant. And so basically taking this uh, covariance from the right hand side, this is the left group. And the right group is the same thing. So if you allow me, I'll erase this. Uh, uh, this is Q of gamma 1 and GL to Z tensor over some group D1, some character chi1. So the important thing is that here the or order of this guy is 12, and order of this guy is 8. And so they are stabilizers of the geodesic and triangle. So this is, by definition, uh, stabilizer in the group GL2Z of this triangle. And this is, by definition, stabilizer of geodesic in the same group GL2Z. OK, so now we are going, so now we understood very concretely what this is. And so uh, uh, we're just uh, going to construct map from here. So this E2 going to wedge 2 of E1. And the construction is done as follows. So I forgot to name these maps. <coughs> Let me call this guy phi n1, phi n2. And this is uh, phi n1. Now the construction is done as follows. So you start with the matrix A, B, C, D. This is matrix from GL to Z. And then uh, the map uh, phi n2 assigns to this this double unit. I will write, then I will explain the notation, because the notation is slightly different from what we had before. Now, who is who here? So first of all, my elliptic curve. Uh, e, in this case, is a test elliptic curve E and a P torsion point, this is, sorry, N torsion point. Okay. Now, uh, what this, so I basically wanted to say that <laughs> uh, I use uh, the same guy as before, but I, uh, I decided to, little, to make a little change of variables, which is useful. Again, it's technical and useful. So I'd use notation theta e 
of a comma b comma c, assuming that a plus b plus c equal to zero, uh, instead of uh, okay. Hmm? P is a torsion point. So you have elliptic curve and a torsion point. So what is uh, Y1 of N? It parameterizes elliptic curves with the data. So what is the data? It's a torsion point, which generates the N torsion points. So you have elliptic curve and a torsion point, and then I use this torsion point in order to produce this double elliptic, or double modular unit. But as, as, as I was saying, it's convenient for me to redefine units in such a way that they define for triple torsion points whose sum to zero. This is done by conventions that theta e of x uh, y. Uh, just a second. Uh, x y. Uh, uh, so You may ignore all these details, but I'm just saying that before I have this double elliptic, uh, double, double unit, double modular unit, which is homogeneous in these three torsion points. Now I can convert it into something which is defined on torsion points, which sum to zero. This is a standard uh, operation. So I'm just, it's just more convenient, because the next formula then will look very nice. Just product of two modular units. That's it. So, uh, so I defined. So I claim that this uh, things define a map com of complexes. Once again, so what I do literally, I take the modular triangulation. I somehow project it to the curve, in some sense. Then I get some triangulated curve, and then I assign to every triangulation on this modular curve some uh, element of the Mimativic uh, coalgebra, and to any Geodesic, which is nothing else but one of Manin's modular symbols, I assign wedge product of two elliptic units. And then the claim that this is a homomorphism of complexes is just equivalent to the key property of this double modular unit that is co-multiplied the way it's co-multiplied. So it's co-multiplied by a cyclic sum, which is nothing else but the boundary of the triangle formula. So that's it. OK, now uh, uh, this explains uh, what happened in the previous lecture. Because in the previous lecture, we had uh, essentially the same picture, except that we had cyclotomic complexes sitting here. And uh, the very appearance of the modular curve in that business was very strange, because modular curve has nothing to do with the cyclotomic story. So now we're saying that actually the whole story came from modular, from story which lives on the modular curve naturally by this homomorphism. And now you can go back to cyclotomic case by specializing to cusp. So let me just explain what specialization means. And then we will be done with that. <coughs> so this is, let me stay here and make this point again. So remember that before we started uh, taking mot uh, motivic fundamental group of GM minus E torsion points or N torsion points, and we were considering different quotients. So we had cyclotomic units. Uh, as a Q of 1 quotient, but as a Q of 2 quotient, we had some links to leak algebra and uh, the cochain complex as a Q of 2, Q of 1 quotient. And the cochain complex of this leak algebra was the object of studies, and then we find out that it's actually the same thing as this modular complex on the projection to the, to the modular curve y1 of f, which gives some information about the Galois action here. But as I was saying, there is no right uh, that modular curve appears here because it seems completely unrelated to, to GM. So this seems to me as the best explanation I can offer, that it appears, yes, but it appears because it comes as a trace of a more fundamental object. And this more fundamental object lives on modular curve. Unfortunately, I, I still have to tell you how the specialization goes, but it's a technical thing. But unfortunately, this explanation uh, doesn't work in any other case, because this relation between a motivic fundamental group, it persists also to groups like GL3Z, for example, and the congruent subgroup there. And it persists uh, with the same level of precision. So whatever was uh, said last time that you have some isomorphism complexes or quasi-isomorphism complexes, absolutely the same thing uh, is true here. But there is, uh, so it somehow begs for explanations like that. This means that there should be some kind of uh, Euler complex. So first of all, notice 
that in order to explain what's happening uh, at the cyclotomic ca case, I have to talk not about balance and elements, but about some resolution of them, this I call Toller complex. Uh, because the main thing happens on the left, not on the right. But uh, so it begs for some kind of older complex living for GL3, but I don't quite see uh, object like that. Uh, just, hmm? to just to clarify, you, they, uh, for the thing over Y1 of N, you don't see any relation to GL3 here. No, 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 once again. So this story, so you take motivic fundamental group of uh, GM minus mu P. Now, as before, I was telling you that, that I have the cyclotomic, this is notation from the last time, uh, Lico algebra. It's a graded Lico algebra, and it uh, has components of degree 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And so it's graded by positive integers. It's a Lico algebra. It's graded by positive integers. So you can ask what's their component in the uh, degree 1. That's cyclotomic units. Then you can ask what happens if you take degree 2 and degree 1 in the simplest case, because there is some kind of local system uh, game also here, but you can s take the simplest possible case, q of 2 and q of 1, and then you get some complex, just as before. So you get complex, which was like sig 2 of mu p uh, going to wedge square of O of, uh, how is called this, take z of zeta p star. It it's clearly goes here. It's not, it's, there is no 1 over p. It clearly goes, you really, uh, you, one really considers this complex. And then this complex uh, has a property, that, for example, its cohomology here uh, is identified with cuspidal cohomology of the modular curve. How it's explained? It's explained as follows, that this complex appears as a deformation of that one. So that picture deforms this picture. And therefore, you can say that uh, it's no longer artificial, and it's no longer out of the blue, so the, 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 the chain complex of the modular curve relates to modular curves, so it's, it's quite natural. But what I'm saying is that you can take the next level, you can go to 6, 3 of mu p, then you go here to, in the co-chain complex, 6, 2 of mu p, uh, tensor of the cyclotomic units. Maybe I'll write this bigger. So you can take this complex, 6, 3 of mu p, you can go to sig 2 of mu p tensor, uh, how I call them, uh, z of zeta p star. And you can go to h cube of, of zeta p star. So I'm talking really about genuine units, not p units. So you can consider this complex. And this complex is quasi-isomorphic to some uh, complex uh, on uh, modular varieties, we have to take GL3R or SL3R, whatever, mod O3, and most importantly, modular here, gamma 1, 3P. So this is a five-dimensional manifold. It has uh, some Voronoi chain complex, which has cells in degree 5, 4, 3, and 2. And so it's a little bit bigger than this complex, but still it, it tells you, it's essentially, it's, uh, first of all, it's quasi isomorphic, and, se and secondly, it's almost isomorphic to this complex. So the difference between them is, is very small and controllable, but isomorphism homology. And that complex tells you everything you want to know about this one. Now, the problem is that I don't know. So, I mean, having this picture, it is very suggestive that there exists some deformation uh, of this complex, which lives over this space. That would be fantastic. I don't. Huh? No, 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 I don't know. Uh, over y1 of n, uh, that's a good question, uh, which I, I, I kind of hesitate to say yes, but I believe I, I let, let me, uh, I probably know the, the answer to this question, but it's not going to explain anything because you're not going to see GL3 anyway. But that's a good question because if you have it over GL3, you're supposed to have it over strata. But over, over SL3, so my imagination is not enough to, to get it. So, and it goes also, you can go to SL4, for example, with the same level of precision. OK, so that, that's somehow one point. So I, I still have to explain how the specialization goes. But what happened here, I kind of insist again and again, that on one hand side, this explains that story uh, and creates something which seems to know on its own. On the other hand, as we are going to see on the second hour, it uh, creates another story, which again has no explanation of the same kind of style. So let me finish with specialization.
Uh, so the uh, setup for this is the following, that you have some DVR, O, and you have the field of fractions, and uh, you have uniformizer here, which you call Q, and you have the residue field, which is O divided by this uniformizer. And then uh, there is a specialization map using this parameter from F star to K star, which works as follows. Take F, function F, I mean, not function element of this uh, fraction field. And then you take uh, F and you divide it by uniformizer to evaluation of f. Now you can take this guy and you can reduce model your maximal ideal. And so that's how you get this map. So what you do, you take the leading singularity, you divide it by using power of u by z, and then take the rest. Now <coughs> there's a lemma. That there exists a map of complexes. So here again, I did not define the block complex, although I did define it on the lecture on the workshop. So maybe I'm not going to do it right now. But there is a block complex, and then the specialization map works uh, equally well on the level of complexes here. So you can specialize this to the block complex over the residue field going to which 2 of k star, the specialization Q map. And how it works, so you take here F1, which F2, uh, going to just literally speci specialization of F1, which specialization of F2. And then uh, if you're sitting in the block complex, then you have F sub 2 going just to the following. So you either get f bar sub 2, or you get 0. So you get f bar if you can take the residue, if this belongs to O star, actually, and it gets 0 otherwise. I mean, it works the simplest possible case. You don't even divide. So if you just, in the functional field case, you kind of restrict it to 0. If you get infinity of 0, you declare it 0. If you don't get 0 infinity, you get a number. You just declare this number to be specialization. All right, so now we have specialization map as a map of complexes. And the main uh, theorem sounds as follows. So, so we assume that P is a prime. And then uh, we take this modular complex. Uh, we take the co-invariance of the modular complex with respect to gamma 1 of n. Everything is tensor Q. And then this guy maps, as was explained before, to this E, to this elliptic incarnation of our complex. And on the other hand, last time, I had mapped to the cyclotomic version of this, the somehow elliptic version, to what I wrote before. This is sig 2 of p, which, which 2 of z, or q, actually, uh, of zeta p star. And then there is a specialization at cusp map. There's, there's a specialization. at cusp map, and there there is a parameter uh, uh, q, which is exponent of 2 pi i tau, tau divided by n, which you use, which depends on n. And so using specialization map at the cusp with this parameter, we get map from elliptic to the circular one. And all these maps are isomorphisms. So uh, as I said, all this diagram does, it explains why this complex relates to, 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 to the modular curve, to the modular 
to the modular complex. OK, so I, it's probably a very natural point to stop here. So what I'm going to do on the second part, I'm going to, going to go to the second flavor, which is the CM flavor of the story. And there, I mean, for me, it's more fun of the story because you kind of the, the, the geometry of the correspondence threefold, it uh, reflects in the geometry of motivic complex in a kind of uh, in more ways. Uh, it, it somehow starts telling you even more information about the complex than before. So, so I'll, I'll tell you how it goes. OK. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but P will never appear again. <laughs> OK. So, mm, so if I take the co-kernel of this map, then it's, I said canonically. So I'm going to comment about this in a, in a little while. So this is H2. Uh, cuspidal of the group gamma 1 of P Q. So it's more to the data. Then we have the group uh, gamma 1 of P, which sits inside of GL2 OK. It's a standard congruent subgroup. OK, now in what sense this isomorphism is uh, canonical? Uh, there are the following additional uh, uh, features of this situation, which uh, probably I mentioned now. Just a second. So, uh, so first of all, Let's see where I got my mouse. Okay. So uh, we have the so called diamond group. So we can take the normalizer of the group gamma 1 of P, uh, modular gamma 1 of P. And this is a so called diamond group of uh, modular forms. And this group is isomorphic to the group F P star divided by some little unit group. And so uh, who is who here? So we have a map from OK to OK mod this prime ideal. This is my FP, uh, the corresponding residue field. And then we have OK star, the units. It's a finite subgroup here. And it projects to something which I denoted mu sub P. So it's just a little uh, tiny subgroup in this growing uh, uh, finite field. Now, uh, on the other hand, the same group is a Galois group of this uh, Kp and local cyclotomic group over K. And so we have two important objects here. So we have this diamond group and the Galois group, which are naturally isomorphic. And uh, this story is naturally acted by the diamond group. And this story is naturally acted by the Galo group. And I cannot say right away that they intertwine to each other because there is a choice involved in the construction of this isomorphism, namely a choice of the uh, p torsion point. But if you tensor this to this uh, group of p torsion points, uh, when I will do the construction, you will see uh, what's going on. If I slightly twist it, then the isomorphism becomes independent of, of the choice of the torsion point. So if, if you miss this point, it's OK. So I'm just saying that there are two groups acting there. And the map is actually intertwined them. And so it's, it's really a natural isomorphism uh, if you twist a little bit this, this complex. OK, so <coughs> that's already something because this group may be non-zero. And if it's non-zero, this is the usual benefit. So you're proving that the action of the motivic Galois group on the motivic fundamental group of elliptic curve minus p torsion points uh, at least not as big as it could be by motivic constraints. It's smaller. It's smaller exactly uh, in this situation by, by this piece because this, this, this uh, second cohomology group of this motivic algebra cannot be killed by anything else. So we live in Q of 2, and there is nothing else which can contribute here. OK, but that's not the point. So the point is that you have uh, that the uh, modular variety somehow intertwines to the story. Now let's see how exactly this works. Uh, 
Yeah. That's a good question. So uh, the Hecke operators, uh, so if you go to the level of homology, then it's okay. But uh, on the level of complexness, it's quite difficult to, uh, it, it's, 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 it's a serious problem how to get Hecke, Hecke operators. <coughs> oh. So now let's formulate a much more precise statement. So there is a thing we should, so first of all, there is a geometric guy which we're talking about here. There's a threefold. Which is H3 divided by this gamma one of P. And so this is the guy whose geometry controls uh, this part of the material fundamental group as I'm going to demonstrate. So the first thing we see, uh, we have this, uh, class called Bianchi complex. So what it is, it's a complex of GL2OK models, so which is a chain complex of the Bianchi triangulation, which looks at this as this. And uh, it uh, depends only on the field K. And so it's acted uh, by the group GL2 OK. Now, mm, uh, this is complex of GL2 OK models. Mm, and so what it is, it's a chain complex of the uh, Bianchi Uh, is it standard terminology? No, no, no. It's uh, Joachim. Ah. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's chain complex of the Bianchi tessellation uh, of H3, hyperbolic space. And uh, 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 so instead of defining this, I'll draw you a picture how it looks like. Then I'll give a definition. So let's take uh, k to be q of i, the Gaussian integers. Then we do the following. So we take hyperbolic plane. So first of all, you, you should have cartoon of this uh, complex numbers. So here you have complex numbers, and you have point zero i, one plus i, and one. And you have intersection of these two points. That's what you put here on the base. Okay, and then you make a pyramid which is growing from this uh, triangulated square. Precisely, you put so you put this geodesics like that. It's I, I'm not good in drawing these pictures, but you put geodesics which connect any two points. I know this is invisible. So, so what you have to do, you have to take the points on the absolute uh, on the bottom, and you have to get a geodesic connecting this, uh, connecting whatever points which are connected by the edges here. Okay. So, let me make another try. So it's something like that. <laughs> but then, most importantly, you make all geodesics going up. Uh, yeah. Then you get some. So what you get is an octahedra. Yes. It's kind of an octahedra. Okay. So. Uh, hmm? uh, I think. I think. I think. I, I think. I, I. I actually might tell you something wrong. So let me, just a second, let me give you another picture which is much cleaner. And then I look at the paper and see what's it. So let, let's do this case which is actually much simpler, Q of rho. This is the Eisenstein numbers. So here the, the, the picture is much simpler. So you just have three points, zero, one, and rho. They have equilateral triangle. So on this picture you have just have three points. And then you join them by geodesics like that. And then just going up. Okay, 
that's it. And, and then you spread it by the GL2, okay? This is just a triangular prism. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. The question is to draw it, how to draw it. And this is the same thing, but the question is whether I draw it <laughs> well and correctly. So this is definitely, uh, I think this is more or less visible. Okay. <laughs> Something like that. Oh, anyway, so, all right. So, uh, uh, so, so, so. Now, how it's defined? So you can define this uh, in a uh, regular way. So you can just say that you take L to be uh, free. This is, as Joachim said, so this is just the, the fundamental domain. Uh, this is, it's not exactly the fundamental domain, just like the modular picture is not exactly the fundamental domain for, 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 for GL2Z, right? It's not exactly the fundamental domain. It's, it's fundamental domain to some congruence subgroup. But I, re I really want this one and not the fundamental domain, okay? So this is not fundamental domain. But still, how you define? So you take a free rank two uh, lattice, uh, uh, OK model. Uh, then you tensor this over C. You take V, which is, is L tensor OK over C. And then to every vector L sitting here, you associate a Hermitian form uh, phi L of F. Hermitian form where? So I take the dual space and I claim that the space H3 is just Hermitian forms on V star, uh, Hermitian positively definite forms on V star modulo R star. And so I'm thinking about my symmetric uh, Lobachevsky space as a, as a uh, Hermitian forms of the dual space. And then if I have vector of the dual space, then I can cook up uh, degenerate uh, Hermitian form just by evaluating this vector on, on L and taking square. And then I take convex half. when L runs through this uh, elements of the lattice L. Then you'll get, so you'll see that what you see on, on the bottom, anyway, so th 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 then I get the picture. So now, all right. So this is a picture for Eisenstein integers. All right, so we have this uh, complex, and now the point is that this complex actually relates to the whole story, not only uh, homology of this complex. So this is complex of GL to KZ models, and it's a resolution of Q. Okay. Mm. Mm. Wait a second. Sorry. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. So, so, so the group, uh, the group GL2 OK acts on this picture, and it has non-trivial but finite stabilizers, which are going to play the crucial role in the story because these are the symmetries of the uh, correlators which you're talking about. Okay. So, before I proceed to the statement, let me introduce a little bit more of uh, data. So we have this elliptic units, uh, we have this units of Kp star, but they sit in a slightly bigger uh, uh, abelian group, a vector 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 space, which I denote this way, and this sits even in a slightly bigger space, which I denote by that. Now, this guy is just spanned by all theta e of z over q, where z belongs to uh, p torsion points of the elliptic curve minus zero. And this is just spelled by all of them 
uh, so z belongs to e k of p. I'm waiting for objection. <laughs> the point is that uh, this does not exist. But nevertheless, I formally add it to the game. It's just uh, useful formally add it to the game. And just so, so this over this is one dimensional. This over this is one dimensional. So this is the, 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 the main object. This is just p units. And this is artificially expanded uh, space of units. Hmm? Uh, why it's not defined? Because in the formula, I can answer this question very formally. I can just say that in the formula, it's zero. So if you plug it to the formula, it gets zero. The ziggly unit looks like zero. You have one minus z. And it's not exactly unit or anything like that. So uh, there is a better answer to this, but let me just treat it as a formal symbol. Uh, OK. <coughs> this is not, not really that important. OK, now the statement, the, 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 the main statement is this. Theorem. Uh, there exists a canonical map of complexes so on on the top we take this Bianchi complex for the field K So we take it coinvariance. And we map it to uh, the complex we care about, the motivic complex. And here is what happens. That's why I had to go through this unpleasant uh, enlarging of the units, artificial enlargement, because it really goes a little bit uh, above all the units. So there is a map of complexes like that. Now, this is really the key guy which you want to know. And the claim is that if you take here subcomplex, which is complex of this cyclotomic units, uh, then it embeds here. And most importantly, this map is a quasi-isomorphism. So we really want to relate this guy and this guy. The relation goes through some complex which is slightly bigger, but controllably bigger. You will see. Not yet. So I can formally is say, huh? Is it part of the map of complex? Uh, yeah, 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 but I didn't uh, yet write it out. So, so here there is a map to the group K3 of the field of the ray class field, tensor Q, which naturally sits as the kernel of this map. So now this is now the diagram is complete. So I sort of didn't want to talk yet about this. So you will see how it appears. So this this error will appear from the main construction. Main construction is that and does not even involve this. So the main point is that this map, let's call this map set one and this is set two. This map is isomorphism. This map is isomorphism. And this map is surjective. And it is non-injective in a very, very interesting way. So we are going to discuss why it's non-injective and what exactly the geometry is responsible for that. It turns out that the geometry of this model of threefold tells you how much this map is not injective and how, how it becomes non-injective. So the cohomology, it, you will see that first dimensional cuspel cohomology have a is one of the two reasons why this map is not injective. Another reason is trivial. OK, so now the construction <coughs> is basically the same as it was uh, on the first hour. Uh, 
the constant, I mean, it's kind of identically the same. So what I need to do, I need to explain how to think about the Bianchi complex. No, 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 no. It's a little more subtle. I don't get map from H3. You will see how it works. It's, it's, it's slightly more interesting. So, but. Yes, I didn't define it, and probably I don't even want to define it because you see this. Uh, uh, let me explain why it's not very essential for us to define it. Because this guy, as a vector space, is E1P plus Q plus Q. Okay? And so definitely, if you take wedge square of this, you will see that this, this pops out. And you will see this error also there. So that's how it's defined. So I can I can give a formal definition, but I don't think it makes any uh, th there's any benefit in doing this because this is the uh, this is this artificial theta e of zero added artificially, and this is uh, this group is actually I'm telling you a little lie. So this is all k p star. Uh, tensor Q plus this plus, plus this. But in any case, so believe me, it's, it's from this lin little linear algebra, li little, uh, 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 this little thing doesn't really matter. I mean, it will matter if you wanted to construct this map, but I'm not probably not even going to talk about this. So what happens, you have cusp of this hyperbolic trifles, and this cusp naturally uh, correspond to you to two copies of EP1 with this here because this EP1 is basically the, the elliptic unit, this uh, uh, parameters of elliptic units, it's they known to match the cusp, and that's how this map goes. And this, this makes this diagram commutative. So the main point of this diagram is here. Okay? Okay, so let's do the construction. Again, so in our case, what simplifies is the class number is one, and therefore I can just say that if I take GL2. OK, divided by gamma 1 of P, just like before. This is this uh, finite field FP square minus 0. And uh, then the construction goes exactly the same way. So first of all, uh, if you take this uh, B K two and take queen variance of that, then just as we did twice before, you can write this as a free abelian group generated by this quotient, by by exactly this quotient, which I can just write as okay. Let me write it once. G L two O K modulo gamma one of T. Tensor over some finite uh, subgroup of chi two, and so we are in B two. So what means B two? We're talking about triangles. Uh, so maybe. <coughs> I have to say that when you think about this, so this is where you have this. Uh, prisms, that's where you have these triangles, that's where you have geodesics, and that's where you have the cusps. And so one need to keep this in mind when we do this geometric construction. <coughs> so this D2 is a, a stabilizer group of a triangle. So it is a finite group, which I'm not going to calculate or say anything about this at the moment. Uh, but uh, we, because we did this, actually, yeah, we, we did this before. This is exactly the symmetric group uh, plus uh, units of um, my quadratic field. All right, so this is just free abelian group generated by triples alpha, beta, gamma in F p cubed minus zero such that alpha plus beta plus gamma equal to zero. Now it's divided by 
Yes, yes, yes. This is the determinant. So this, this character tells you about changing. So there is a stabilizer group. Now look how stable group looks like. So first of all, there are standard symmetries of the triangle. And then there is the change orientation. But also, there is a group of units on the, on the whole thing. And uh, one need to remember about this. Maybe. So okay, this is sorry. Maybe I, I just I I, I I I made a mistake by saying this. So this is just the hydral relations. So this is uh, the the group. Uh, this is the group of the symmetries of the triangle. Now how the map works? It's very clear. So you just take this map theta two. It takes this triple of alpha, beta, gamma, and sends it to this double unit, alpha p or z, beta z, gamma z, uh, where z uh, is a generator of the p torsion points. And so uh, now you see from that that if you have particle triple which corresponds to one of your triangle, then the symmetries of this object are exactly the symmetries of the triangle. Plus, also this object has a symmetry that the group of automorphisms of the elliptic curve acts by symmetries of this object, which is a finite group of units, which is also reflected in this picture if you think <coughs> about this. OK, now the second map is entirely similar. So you have uh, now B. 1k coinvariance, and you can write this down as just free abelian group by pairs of raised this mod p divided by the relations that alpha beta equals minus beta alpha equals epsilon alpha epsilon beta by epsilon this automorphism. But that's exactly the symmetries of the wedge product of two Ziegler units. So the map works as follows. So theta 1 takes this alpha beta, and it goes to wedge product of two Ziegler units. So I'm s uh, saying again and again that these formulas are identical to the formulas which we used before when we made the map from the modular complex to the complex which lives on the modular curve. The only uh, difference is that in this case, we have complex multiplication, and we're using this to bookkeep the, the torsion points. The torsion modulus is rank one model over uh, the group of become, uh, yeah, over this uh, uh, FP star. OK, so that's it. Now, this is a map of complexes. Again, this is obvious from the description of the coproduct. So we get a map of complexes. And what is uh, important is that the trivial symmetries of this complex, I mean, the fact that we have stabilizer here and we had stabilizer there, they're reflected by exactly by the uh, properties of the double uh, modular units and the wedge square of the Ziegler units, which we uh, talked about before. Okay? But now we, we, we have actually more. Uh, now, what, what kind of more we have? Mm, first of all, if you take some element from here, so if you take this tetrahedra, so if you take this tetrahedra, then uh, if you take uh, the faces of this tetrahedra, so you take tetrahedra here, take it faces here. So if you take it faces and then go here, you get zero. But if you take faces and go here, and then go here, you also get 0 because this diagram is commuted. So going this way is the same as going this way. This means that, uh, let me redraw it again. Mm. If you start with this group of this uh, polyhedrons and go to B2, to group of triangles, then go to E2, and then go to wedge square of OK star, then this composition is 0. Why it's 0? Because you can think about this this way. And this is already 0, and this diagram is commutative. Now, because it's 0, this means that this map goes here to such element uh, which lives in the kernel of this map. But the kernel of this map is known 
from, it's a non-trivial serum, it's a Suslin serum, but still, it's a known serum that the kernel, uh, what Suslin serum tells you, let me tell you. <coughs> so there is a Bloch complex And uh, so the map here on the generator takes x sub 2 going to 1 minus x which x. Now, if you take the co-kernel of this map, this is k2 according to Matsumoto's theorem for any field f. And if you take the kernel of this map, then uh, modular torsion, it's isomorphic to k3 in the composable of this field f, modular torsion. There is a much more precise statement which describes actually uh, this case three and decomposable literally as extension of this group by tor f star f star extended by the group of two elements, but we don't quite need this. So what's important for us is that modular torsion case three and decomposable is the kernel of that map. And by the theorem which I stated in the first hour, this uh, complex sits in the block complex. Therefore, uh, the, uh, there's definitely a map to case three of the field k sub p here, tensor q, uh, which comes out of this picture. Just because this map is zero, so the, 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 the linear combination of, let's say, in, in the uh, Gaussian case, I don't know how, how many of them. Uh, look like eight to me. Some, some number, some small number of, of these triangles, which are faces of this polyhedron, the linear combination is not that it's zero, but it, 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 it at least definitely lies in K3. So this is a kind of relation, and that's a sim this, this is a kind of local relation, okay? I, hmm? This number is indecomposable. Yes, but the K3 indecomposable is the same as K3 because it's a number field. So, uh, so we, uh, what we observed, we observed that this polyhedron, every polyhedron of this uh, triangulation, I mean, different polyhedrons a priori gives you different elements in K3. So we get a map from polyhedrons to K3, uh, which I just explained where does it come from. It comes from the fact that uh, the boundary of this polyhedron, when you take its next boundary, is zero, but the boundary itself gives you this linear combination of these double modular units, which from Suslin theorem follows that this linear combination must land in K3. So this is a kind of local relation, which uh, already quite non-trivial. So I don't know how to, I mean, it's still possible to see it without relation to, to, to the modular picture, but uh, still. But now there is something more interesting going on because uh, you can have now H1 coming to the game. Sorry, yes. Like this is unknown. No, 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 no. No, th there is a map from this group to this one. Yes. What's your question? Does it land inside K3 of K itself? Uh, K3 of K is a tiny group, so it's just one dimensional group. Yes. Yes, I actually don't know answers to any of these questions. Because, okay. because what? Well, the, these prisms somehow morally look like K3. Exactly, exactly. So let me just translate what actually said. Actually, said that, look, so you have another construction. The construction is the following. That if you take this prism, and if you calculate the volume of this prism, then you're going to get a multiple of zeta k of two of your field, for good reason. The reason is that if you take this prism, then if you calculate the den invariant of this prism, then you're going to see that zero. Just make a call. I mean, it's very easy to see that this is zero because they form this, this three-dimensional manifold. This will imply this is zero. But the den invariant turns out to be the same as delta of, uh, it, it's, it's, it's relates directly uh, to, to this, uh, okay, let me go more slowly. Whenever you have a hyperbolic polyhedron, you can write this as a sum of ideal hyperbolic synthesis, zero, one, infinity, sum the i's, okay? So now if you want to calculate the den invariant of, uh, of this guy, that's going to be something like logarithm of one minus z, tensor argument of z uh, minus uh, vice versa. So you're going to, to see some kind of imaginary part of, of the form of the Steinberg relation, one minus z tensor z. And so it's easy to deduce from this that if the den invariant is zero, then you get element, the linear combination of the z i sub two, is going to lie in the kernel of this, uh, of, this of this map delta in the block complex. That's what you were about to say, right? And because of that, it defines element in K3 of the field K. However, the, case, the K3 of K is tiny, it's just one dimensional space. And so uh, you detect this element, this element definitely non-zero because regulator is the volume of this prism, definitely non-zero number. But on the other hand, I'm not saying 
that this construction relates to that one. This gives you a different element history, and I don't know too much about this element except that it's produced this way. Okay. Uh, the invariant is this. So, in the if you live in a Euclidean space, if you have a polyhedron, then you take the sum over edges of this polyhedron, the length of this edge, multiplied by the dihedral angle. Sorry about that again. Dihedral angle at this edge. Okay. Sure. Uh, what you do, you renormalize. You take a horror cycle, horror, horror sphere, and you cut it out everywhere. Then you get a finite sum. Now it does not depend on the way you cut because if you look at the contributions, if you cut by a different uh, amount, then you have a constant multiplied by sum of the angles, which is sum of the angles of the triangle proportional to pi pi zero because it's r mod pi z. So this is well defined. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, so and and it turns out to coincide with uh, with a co if you if you map this ideal simplex to the Bloch complex, it turns out to be a map of complexes. All right, so we got some relation between, uh, 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 so this group maps to K3, but there is a more interesting <coughs> statement because if we, uh, if we just take the kernel of the map from B2 to B1, gamma 1 of p. This also maps to uh, k3 uh, of this kp. Why? By the same argument. Because we have here some linear combination of triangles of this uh, Bianchi decomposition. But it's such that when you take the boundary, you get 0. This is a map of complexes. This means that you get here sum of modular, double modular units such that under coproducts they die. This means that yes, they come in the kernel, which is k3. So this means that you produced a map from here to K3. And this map actually, mm, so there is a third group here, which is H1 cuspidal of gamma 1 of P. And so in the end of the day, uh, what happens is that, uh, I mean, any element here produces the element in, in, in H, H1 of gamma 1. Uh, but there are some, mm, you know, the image of the B3 here gives you doesn't change this element. So in any case, there is a map from here to here. So on the level of cycles, you just take kernel of this map you made to K3. This means that this group makes to K3, but actually to the image of this uh, map from B3 to K3 of Kp. So now this is a well-defined map. So it's a canonical map from cuspidal cohomology of gamma one of P to some little, to some quotient of the group K3 of Kp. But no matter what, what you observe here is the following, that your original problem was the problem of understanding how the Galois group acts on p torsion points of this CM elliptic curve. So we realized that this problem is controlled by this complex, I'd better to say by this complex. Now, this complex has some elements which span, this, uh, there is some span of this vector space. And this vector space is what we're looking for. This is the image of the Galois group in the, in the, in the Q of two, in the, in the weight uh, Q of two. So it's, it's spanned by some elements, but there are some relations between these elements. So the relations are of three different kinds. So there are trivial relations, which is this dihedral symmetry relations, which are built into the definition of this complex that's well defined. But then there are more interesting relations tells you that for two different reasons, some linear combinations uh, of this double elliptic units equal to some elements in case three, maybe zero, but at least element in case three. So they come for what I call local reason from this polyhedrons, or more interestingly, they come from H1 cuspidal of this gamma one of P. And here I really don't know, so I mean, if, if you didn't know this picture, you can still ask the question what relations between this double, uh, double elliptic units. So the question is well posed. The answer is sitting here, but the answer is in the terms which is impossible to see in in terms of the question, at le unless you know the relation to, to the model of variety. So it, again, this is the same phenomenon as we have seen. That first of all, the, the cohomology here is H2, the cohomology here is essentially H1, and none of them is uh, visible. And they actually dual to each other. They actually have the same ranks, which is also completely unclear. It's unclear why uh, the co-kernel here has the same rank as the sporadic relations which we see there. OK. So that, that's the picture for, uh, for the imagined quadratic field. And uh, there are some 
other incarnations of this uh, picture. For example, one can consider not just hyperbolic threefold, but some local system of a hyperbolic threefold and treat more general uh, elements in the image of the Galois group. But the most basic is this one. Okay, that's it.